We're going to continue through, um, starting at verse number 9. We looked at verse number 8 on Sunday morning, talking about um, Joe Rogan. But we're going to look at verse number 9 on, and, and especially um, at this point in, the sur if in Colossians chapter 3, the, the Bible really starts talking about relationships between um, brothers and sisters in Christ here for the next few verses. It gives some very specific advice on how to handle your relationships with your fellow Christians. So let's go ahead and look at that. And a couple of these things we've, we've talked about before, but there's one thing specifically that I'm going to spend some time on this evening that I don't think I've actually preached an entire sermon on. So we're going to look at this idea tonight. But let's go ahead and look at verse number 9 and get into the sermon right away. Colossians chapter 3, look at verse number 9. The Bible says here, now we're talking about relationships um, with each other. So here we, we had some advice on you know putting off anger, wrath, malice, all these things, things that you should do. Now um, Paul is going to start talking to you about how you should be treating each other, how we should relate to one another in the church. Look at verse number 9 where the Bible says, Lie not to one another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of of him that created him. So there's some pretty specific um, advice here. And now it's, it just basically says don't lie to each other. <laughs> don't, be, don't be liars. Now look, lying is one of those things that, you know, we use this sin all the time out soul winning. I think it's one of these things that we talk about so much that, you know, we kind of like pass over it sometimes. We use it all the time just to prove like everybody's a sinner because like everybody has lied, right? Everyone's done it. But the thing is, we don't ever want to get to the point where we're like, we talk about it so much, we use it as a sin that everybody has done, where we're like, yeah, it's no big deal, right? So, first of all, look, is it ever okay in the Bible? I was having this discussion um, with my family, and, you know, there is a couple points in the Bible where somebody lied. And, you know, it's not that God in those points, to actually turn to Exodus chapter 1, and we'll look at one of those um, points this evening, um, but there is actually a point in the Bible where somebody lied, and, you know, God, it never says that God was okay with it, but it did say, you know, God, God didn't judge it. Okay, he didn't judge it. Look at Exodus chapter 1. The two points in the Bible that I can think of specifically, I, I think there's some other minor issues where people lied in the Bible, um, where God didn't judge it, but is where the midwives in, you know, in Egypt, they lied to the Egyptians saying that they, you know, we'll look at that here in a second, but they lied to save the children of Israel. They were supposed to kill the male children and they lied about it so they wouldn't have to kill the male children. And then of course there was Rahab who also lied um, to get the spies out to, to help the spies. So let's just look at one of these examples. Look at Exodus chapter 1 and verse number 15. Exodus chapter 1, look at verse number 15. The Bible says, And the king of Egypt spake unto the Hebrew midwives, of which the name was one was Shipra, and the name of the other Pua. And he said, when do you either do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see that the, uh, sit upon the stools? If it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then he shall live. So, of course, you know, Pharaoh was worried that, you know, the, the, the Israelites were just like they were spreading. And they were just like they were, they were growing too fast. Their numbers were getting too big. So he wanted all the male children to be killed. Okay, but the midwives feared God. And did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives, and he said unto them, Why have ye done this thing, and have saved the men children alive? And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively, and they are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. They said basically the children were born. They didn't need the midwives. They delivered the babies without midwives. Therefore God dealt with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. So look, this was a lie for good, you could say. It was a, it was a lie that, caused, that, that stopped murder in, in this case, right? It was, a, it was a terrible time of oppression. You know, look, it doesn't say that the midwives, I mean, just think about this situation. It doesn't say the midwives saved all, you know, the Hebrew uh, male children. But I mean, they saved some of the children. But look, the point I'm trying to make is, you know, people justify lying because they say, oh, it's a small lie, or oh, you know, I had to lie. But the point I'm trying to make is the two points in the Bible that, you know, were, were what you want to, want to call lies that God was okay with, maybe you could make that argument. 
They were saving people's lives. I mean, they were, they were saving people's lives against an oppressive government that was there to murder people. Okay? So let's be real. These are very extreme cases that none of us have been in. Right? So the point is that lying is a, actually a big deal in the Bible. So it's not that we should go out and just talk about it so much soul winning that we just, it just becomes a small thing to us. The Bible here is saying don't lie to each other. Look, if you want to have good relationships, don't lie to each other. But the fact is, is that people don't lie today to, you know, save people's lives, to stop an oppressive government from getting people. They lie to, to cover sin. You know, they lie to turn to Proverbs chapter 6. They lie to lift themselves up. They lie to destroy. They lie to, you know, make other people look bad. Look at Proverbs chapter 6. Let's look at what God thinks about lying. It's not a small thing. Look at Proverbs chapter 6 and verse number 16. The Bible says, These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. And then we're going to see seven things listed here. The Bible says, A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that divideth, deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. It's interesting to note that out of these seven things, at least three of them, I could argue more than three, but at least three of them have to do with lying. And these are things that the Lord hates. So my point I'm trying to make is this is an easy one and it's not the point of the sermon, is that lying just because we talk about it all the time out soul winning is something that we should strive to not do in our lives, obviously. Especially... To each other. I mean, look, just embrace truth in your life is all you have to do. And look, all you have to do to not be a liar and to embrace truth is just embrace this idea that, because look, you're going to make errors in your life. You're going to mess things up in your life. You're going to say things that you shouldn't have said in your life. You're going to do things that you shouldn't have done in your life. Just own those things. That's it. That's how, you not, that's how you're not a liar. Just own those things. And guess what? If you go through your life where you're just like, you know what? Whenever I make a mistake, I'm just going to own that mistake. And first of all, you should own that mistake as quickly as possible. There's a time factor in there. If you hang on, if you hang on to the sinking ship, you know, you're obviously much more you know, likely to drown. If you hang on to, to a bad idea, you hang on to a lie, you hang on to something, some sin that you've done or you're into, the better, the quicker you get in the truth, and the quicker you just own that mistake, the better it's going to be for your life, the people around you, all of that. And guess what? If you become a person that owns your mistakes, and you just like, right away, you're just like, ah, I'm sorry about that. Ah, uh, yes, I did that. I'm sorry. Guess what? You're going to think twice before making those mistakes. You're going to think twice, because look, uh, owning your mistakes isn't fun. Nobody thinks it's fun to go up to people and be like, hey, you know, I'm sorry that I did that to you, or I'm sorry that I said these, these things, or I'm sorry I did these things. Look, that's, that's not a good time for anybody. Even though that's what you should do, it'll make you think about doing things like that in the future. It'll make you think about that. But if, some, if you just, like, this person just covers everything up and just never wants to take responsibility for anything, they're just going to become known as a liar, unfortunately. So embrace the truth in your life. And look, lying especially about sin, will just make things worse and worse and worse. Think about David. Think about David. He starts out, you know, with lust, and that ends up into adultery. Then he starts lying. Then he starts lying to cover things up, and then what happens? Now we have murder. Now we have murder of multiple people. Multiple people were murdered to cover up David's adultery. So back to, you know, Colossians. The point is, don't lie to each other. Turn to Proverbs chapter 12. Turn to Proverbs chapter 12. 12. Yes, I get it. We've all lied. But look at Proverbs chapter 12, and we'll close the book on lying this evening. But look at Proverbs chapter 12. We have all lied. It is true that we are all liars. We go out soul winning, and we read that to people, and we're like, you know, and all liars. I get it. We're all liars. But guess what? Look at Proverbs chapter 12, and look at verse number 22. The Bible says, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. But they that deal truly are his delight. Yes, we have all lied, but guess what? There are some people that would be known as honest and some people that will be known as liars. That's what Proverbs chapter 22 is saying. 
It's saying, look, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but there are people that deal truly. There are people that deal truly, and you want to have that name that you deal truly with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 10. So that's pretty, that's pretty Christianity 101 right there. Let's go on to some more complex um, you know, relationship advice from Colossians chapter 3 this evening. Look at verse number 10. And the Bible says, And put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. So what are we dealing with here again? We're dealing with people from all different cultures, all different places. Paul's saying there's none of that. He's like there's none of these nationalities, there's none of there's Greeks nor Jews, there's none of that. He's like we're all in Christ. He says, "Put on therefore as the elect of God, you're saved. You're all saved. That is the, the, what you all have in common. That is your culture now. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing. And then, then we see a semicolon. Okay? So we see all these things separated by commas. These are all characteristics that we're to have to do what? So we can for, forbearing one another. This idea of forbearing one another. So we're, we're supposed to have bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, while we're doing this, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So let's look at this idea, all these characteristics that we're supposed to have so we can forbear one another. I'm supposed to, look, I'm supposed to forbear you. You're supposed to forbear me. You're supposed to forbear each other. What does it, so what does it mean? Shouldn't we understand what it means to forbear one another? Forbearing, turn to Romans chapter 2. Forbearing, and look, you should appreciate forbearing. You should appreciate forbearing. I'll show you why in Romans chapter 2. But forbearing means to behave in a patient way at a time where you, ha we, you would have a right to be upset or angry. It means that you have a right to be mad. You have a right to pass judgment, but you don't. You withhold that. You just, you have patience. You have, that's why it says long suffering right before it goes into forbearing. It's basically to be, to be forbearing means to hold back judgment, to be patient, to have self-control. And here's why it's important, why you do your very best to be forbearing. Look at Romans chapter 2 and look at verse number 4. Romans chapter 2 and verse number 4. The Bible says, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness? So this is, Paul here is talking about the riches of God's goodness towards us. Okay, he's saying, Do you despise the riches of his goodness and what? And forbearance and long suffering. See how those two go together? Just like in Colossians chapter 3. So God has forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. So the Bible here is saying is that God is forbearing towards us. That's God's goodness towards us, is his forbearance towards us. He's, that means God is delaying his judgment towards us. Forbearance means we deserve it, but he's, he's just delaying. He's holding back that, that judgment that he could righteously pour down upon us. He's just being patient. He's being long-suffering with us. I mean, think about, this is like our country right now. Our country, you could, you could easily say right now, because we look at all the wickedness going on in this country. We look at all the, the horrible things that our country is doing. And we, you, could, you could say, rightly so, looking at Romans chapter 2 and verse number 4, that we are under the forbearance of God in this country right now. I mean, look. We're running on God's forbearance of his judgment. Look, we deserve it. We deserve it, but we're operating, we're operating in the red. Think about, a, you know, think about a tachometer on your car. When you get in your car tonight, you'll have a, a tachometer on the, uh, on, you know, uh, you know, it shows the RPMs of your engine, and there'll be a red part. When it gets up to, you know, four or 5,000 RPM, there'll be a red part. Guess what? If you rev your engine into that red zone, your engine is not going to explode right away. You can operate for a certain amount of time in that red zone. 
But eventually, you're going to be in trouble if you're running your car in that red zone. Look, because of the abortion in this country, because of the blasphemy in this country, because of turning our backs on God, because of the normalized sin, because of the perversion, because of all these things in general, just, just rejecting the Word of God, rejecting Jesus Christ, we are operating in this red zone. We are operating in the forbearance zone of God in this country. We're redlining the engine in this country. And look, you know, I don't know. Here's what I do know. If you run your engine in that red zone constantly, you will blow up the engine at some point. Judgment's coming on this country. The forbearance is just a delaying of judgment. It's not a taking away of judgment. If you know anything from the Bible, if you know anything from the Old Testament especially, it's that that judgment, if it's deserved, is coming. God is just giving us more time. And I like to think that ministries like this and, and, and you know, ministries like ours, I like to think that we're, we're maybe delaying that judgment. That we're maybe, you know, helping God be more forbearing. Helping God be more long-suffering. Just, tell, you know, convincing God in some small way. Give us a little bit more time. Every single week, we get more people saved in this ministry. And then, you know, just God looks down, and I'm just hoping he says, maybe, maybe another week. Maybe another two weeks. Maybe another two months. But we are definitely operating in God's forbearance zone. And I'm thankful as a Christian, for God's forbearance towards us. So what is Paul saying in, in Colossians chapter 3? He's saying we should have that same forbearance towards each other. So I'm going to give you two steps tonight on how to, be, how to be forbearing to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. I'm going to give you two simple steps to be more forbearing in your life. Hopefully, you're a forbearing person, but you should be more forbearing. Step one is this. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 7, and I'll explain to you step one. Step one is this. Here's how you become more forbearing in two simple steps. The first step is this. Stop being offended by everything. That's step one. Get, look, give people the benefit of the doubt in your life. You know, there's a lot of things that people get offended about that, you know, may just... Maybe people should just think, you know what, maybe they didn't mean it that way. Some people just think the worst of every situation. And these types of people, look, every, they, they, you know, they're so easily offended, they think every little thing, was that talking about me? These people that are offended by every little situation, they're, they're just, they're never going to have any friends if you're this type of person. Somebody didn't say hi to me. Or somebody didn't smile at me the way that they smiled at me last week. Look, there's people that operate their lives this way and they're never going to have any friends because they're not forbearing. If you are so sensitive that you get offended by everything, that is the exact opposite of forbearing, folks. Look, I mean, we, I don't know when I walk in here on Wednesday, I don't know what you've gone through for three days since I saw you or two days since I saw you on Sunday. You don't know what I've gone through. I don't know what Brother Matt's gone through. Maybe just like horrible things happen to you and you know, Brother Matt comes in and he just doesn't, doesn't really say hi and, and, and click his heels together like he usually does or whatever. You know, maybe, maybe that's just something that I should just be like, man, maybe he just had a bad couple days and I shouldn't just take everything so personally you know, in my life. You know, people are too sensitive today and they're forbearing Nothing. So let it go. Forbear it. You know, not forbearing is actually um, selfish, actually. And that's why it talks about humility and meekness in the, in the words right before being forbearing. It talks about mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, it says. Meekness in verse number 12. Long-suffering. Now look at Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Look at verse 22. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 21, I'm sorry, verse 21. This is such a brilliant piece of wisdom right here. If it, you know, you would never know this if it wasn't in the Bible. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse number 21. The Bible says, Also, take no heed unto all the words that are spoken, lest thou hear thy servant curse thee. For oftentimes also thine own heart knoweth that thou thyself likewise hath cursed others. 
You know, the best way I can explain these two verses is I was thinking like of an analogy I could give you to explain these two verses. I mean, hopefully you understand those two verses, but think about like road rage. This is such a great way to explain this. Road rage. I had this friend one time that I used to work with like 15 years ago. He was like, you know, he was the quietest guy. But you get in a car with him, like I never wanted to ever get in a car with him because the guy was crazy. You get in a car, and he was like the worst road rage person ever. I don't know what his problem was, but think about road rage for a minute. Think about road rage. You get these people, and they pull up behind somebody at a stoplight, and the stoplight goes green, and the person doesn't like take off like they're in a NASCAR race, right? And like a second, maybe two seconds, three seconds goes by, and they're just like, Aah! they're ready to run over the person in front of them. They're ready to smash cars. They're ready to, I mean, this guy, you would get in a car with this guy, and before he would let somebody merge, he would get in a car accident. He actually said that. He's like, I'm not letting this guy in. Brace for impact, he told me one time. I'm just like, man, what's the deal? You know, because he's like, this guy, he should have got in back there. You know, and it's just, you know, what's that guy thinking? He's thinking, idiot, moron, this guy doesn't know how to drive. He's thinking, this, this guy, he's thinking, I would never do this. Right? This is the road rage guy. He says, I'll never do this. I would never do this. And then he gets to the light, the next light up ahead after he just berates somebody and honks at somebody. And he gets at the next light, and he's the front of the light. And he's texting on his phone, and the light goes green. And here's somebody's honking at him. And he's all, hey, hey. <laughs> And he just did it to somebody else. You know, this is, this is Ecclesiastes chapter 7. 21 and verse 22. Look, don't be offended by everything that you hear, is what it's saying, because if the, the things that you have said would probably offend other people as well, is what it's saying. And it's this crazy correlation. It's this crazy correlation that Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 21 and 22 makes that, look, if you didn't have life experience and or the Bible, you would never make, you would never guess this correlation. But the people that are offended by everything, in verse 21, you should make a note of this in your Bible, because this is so true. The people that are offended by everything, verse 21, are the same people in verse 22 that are constantly saying things that offend or would offend other people if they heard those things. It's, it, it's so true. Solomon's wisdom just pops right out of the Bible here. It's, it's just the greatest thing. It's Look, it's, it's the same. If you live in a glass house, don't throw stones. Right? But the truth is that people that live in a glass house are walking around with shotguns, blasting shotguns everywhere. That's how it works. And that's what Ecclesiastes chapter 7 is talking about. Look, just, you just can't be offended by, by everything that you hear. Because if everybody heard everything that you ever said ever in your house or wherever, they would be offended as well. Just think about that. I mean... As a pastor, I just can't allow certain things in a church, but let me tell you something. If I was obsessed with things that people said to me constantly, if I was just constantly offended or annoyed, I just, like, I just couldn't be in the ministry. It just wouldn't be possible, you know? So look, if you can have mercy on people in these cases and just give people the benefit of the doubt, just be like, you know, I'm sure they didn't mean anything by that. You know, be forbearing. You will have great relationships if you can do this. That's, that's what Paul is talking about in Colossians chapter 3. We live in a society today, actually, look, this is actually a term now. It's actually a term, I think it's in the dictionary now, but we live in a society that is convincing everyone that they should be offended at everything, constantly. It's called, there's a generation called the snowflake generation now. If you became an adult in 2010, you're called the snowflake, the snowflake generation. The actual definition is someone who has an inflated view of their uniqueness, of their importance. It wasn't humility part of being forbearing. Wasn't, you know, having an inflated view of how important you are is the opposite of meekness. It says a snowflake is a person who has an inflated view of their uniqueness, of their importance. They have a sense of entitlement. They're overly emotional and they're easily offended. This is the snowflake. So look, we should have no part of that. We should have no part of whatever culture is popping up in this country. We're not taking part of anything that this, this country, this culture moves to. We're staying where we are. We went over that um, on Sunday morning. So basically, step one is don't be a snowflake. You know, don't be offended by every single little thing you hear. And, you know, you've probably said worse. 
is what it comes down to. So that's step one. Just don't be a snowflake. Don't be offended by everything. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So if you want to be a forbearing person, just let things, you know, give people the benefit of the doubt. He must have had a bad day. You know, Brother George comes in and he's super rude to me. It's just like, hey, he had a bad day. Whatever. Okay? I mean, it's just the way you have to be. Be forbearing to people. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, what if, what if things like more than words? You know, what if there's like actual like business relationships or something like that that go bad? Well, what do we do then? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This goes for, you know, comments and things people say as well. But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at verse number 7. So here Paul is talking about, the, he goes into this church, and this church, they're just like, they're just like taking each other to the law for everything. So they're, they, have, they have conflicts in the church, and they're taking each other to like the, you know, the, uh, the civilian authorities outside the church. And he says, you know, he basically says, like, why would you go to the godless for these things? He's like, can't you judge yourselves? He's like, you're saved. You're, you're saints. Now, therefore, look at verse 7. There is utterly fault. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault amongst you, among you because you go to law one with another. Why do you rather not take wrong? Why do you rather not suffer yourselves to be defrauded? So I understand the conflict here that Paul is talking in this specifically is about, you know, they're basically suing each other is what's going on. They're basically ratting each other out to the authorities. He's saying, hey, handle things in-house. But the main thing he's saying here is just, just suffer yourself to be wronged. Amen. Just suffer yourself to be wronged. Look, if you can, if you can just suffer yourself to be defrauded, Say somebody just did say something that was just blatantly rude to you or to me or to whoever. Look, if you can, just suffer yourself to be defrauded. I mean, sticks and stones may break my bones. Words will never hurt me. You know, what about, what about like this one where you could actually take somebody to court, though? What about, you know, brother, you know, so-and-so borrows brother so-and-so a, a, a thousand-dollar tool, and he just destroys it. And he, he just wrecks the tool, and, and he's like, you know what? I just don't have the money to pay you. So, I mean, li literally, you could end up with a situation like that in the church where one brother could actually take another brother to small claims court and, and sue him for that tool. And the Bible here is saying, Paul is just saying, you just let it go. Just suffer yourself to be defrauded. It's like, well, it's $1,000, though. Yeah, but here's the thing. It's, who cares? It's just money. And, it, and if you can't afford to lose something, look, if you can't afford to lose something, you should never borrow it to somebody in the first place. If you can't afford to, you know, borrow somebody $500 and never get that $500 back, don't give it to them in the first place. Just assume that it's gone when you borrow something. That's a good, safe practice, especially within a church. You know, if you're going to borrow somebody your car, you know, look, whenever I borrow and throw somebody the keys to my car, look, if you total it, I mean, I hope no one gets hurt, but if you total it, like, literally, there will be zero problems between us. Because, I mean, who cares? It's a car. And hopefully, you know, nobody gets hurt in the situation would be the main concern. But the point is, if, if, if a car, if, if something that I had was so important to me that borrowing it to you would literally endanger our relationship because I couldn't forbear that, I couldn't suffer myself to be defrauded from that thing, I should never, I, look, I should never be in that position anyway with material things. But if, if I am, I should never borrow it. Because what I'm doing is I'm taking risk with our relationship. And I should never do something like that. You should never do something like that. Now look, if, if, if somebody, you borrow somebody money and, and they just don't pay you back, look, let it go. Forgive it, forget it, move on. That doesn't mean you have to keep borrowing them money. That doesn't mean that you think that that person's trustworthy or you think that they're responsible. That's, that's not what it means. It just means that you're going to move forward with no ill will about that situation. Okay, go back to Colossians chapter 3. Go back to Colossians chapter 3. So those are the two steps. Just basically, don't get offended by every single thing that happens, every th single thing that's said. We've all said plenty of things that would offend plenty of people if everybody knew everything that we ever said about everybody. Yeah. I mean, that's ridiculous. Just don't be offended. Sometimes people have a bad day. Sometimes people don't get back to your text right away. Sometimes, you know, just... All these things that people can get so easily offended about, just you gotta, you got to forbear people. If you want to have long-lasting, strong relationships 
With your brothers and sisters in Christ, you've got to be a forbearing person. The first one is to just not be offended by every little thing. The second one is to just suffer yourself to be defrauded. Suffer yourself to be defrauded. Okay? Especially material things. Look, folks, they don't matter. Amen. None of it matters. None of it is worth uh, just a, a friendship. We'll get to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 13. So we're going to forbear. We're going to forgive. We're going to let things go. Look at verse 13. And above all these things, put on charity. That's love, which is the bond of perfectness. In verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be thankful, and be ye thankful. Here's the reasoning behind it right here in verse 15. The reasoning between all, for all of this advice that we're getting from verse 9 up to verse 15 is so peace can rule in our hearts. It's so the peace of God can rule in our hearts. Who would want to live with strife and contention in their life? Why? Why would people want that? You want peace with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And look, with honesty and forbearance, that's what you will get, is peace. I mean, the other choice is what we saw earlier. Anger, wrath, malice. Seems an easy choice on which one that we should choose. Now, here's the last thing I want you to remember tonight. Turn to James chapter 2. So why, why, I mean, why, why doesn't everyone choose this, right? I mean, when we're, you know, why, why shouldn't we just all forbear each other, all forgive each other, all be honest with each other? This is the last thing I want you to think about right here. Look at James chapter 2. This is a philosophy that God operates on, and you need to understand this. Whenever we are asked to do something with our brothers and sisters, our neighbors, when we are asked to treat them in a certain way, this is a super important methodology that is throughout the Bible. When you are asked to treat your brothers, your sisters, your neighbors, those around you in a certain way, because God treats you that way, there's something that you need to understand. Look at James chapter 2. There's a philosophy that you need to understand. Look at James chapter 2 and verse number 13. The Bible says this. It says, For he shall have judgment without mercy. Oh. So here's a guy, here's a guy that's going to get judgment with no mercy. Who wants to be that guy? Raise your hand. That just, when he does something wrong, whether it's your brothers and sisters, whether it's God, it's just judgment right away. Look, forbearance isn't about, look, forbearance is not about the absence of fault. Forbearance is being patient and long-suffering even though there has been a fault. The Bible says, for he shall have judgment without mercy that showed no mercy. And mercy rejoice, rejoiceth against judgment. So the point I'm trying to make is if you are going to be this type of person that is going to bring down the world on people and have no mercy on people, no forgiveness on people, no forbearance on people, God is not going to grant you those things. That's what you need to understand. We are all operating individually in the forbearance zone of God. Romans chapter 2 and verse number 4. We are all underneath God's forbearance. So if you decide, I'm just not going to forbear other people, and I'm just going to forget about this, you're, you're at a major risk in your life. So humble yourself and forbear, because the more you grant, the more will be granted to you in your life. Now, people do this, people do this with people's kids, people do this with all, I mean, people are so judgmental about other people's kids. This is a perfect example. You know, it's just, it fits in right with the road rage. People are so judge, they have no mercy on other people's kids. Look, they have no forbearance. Think about it. It's not that kids don't do anything wrong, but when somebody else's child does something wrong, they just like come down on them like a, like a ton of bricks. But then it's like, my children can do no wrong in their life. Look, those people will be given no mercy by God. And look, all of our kids are going to do things wrong. So, I mean, grant mercy and forbearance and you will get that back to yourself. It's literally, look, it's literally we're talking about a win, win, win here tonight. We're talking about you win, your brother wins, and God wins. You got to embrace those situations in your life. Look, it's hard. It's hard to do because you get in the flesh. 
You get in the flesh and you get mad that somebody did, did wrong to you. You get upset that somebody did wrong to you. Forbearance, like I said, somebody has done wrong to you or you perceive that they've done wrong to you. Forbearance is just is letting that go. It's letting it go. You got to recognize these win-win-wins and take them in your life. And the better you can get at this and the better you can, you can shut off your flesh and, and just you know, kill that inner, that, that, that person that wants to just have no mercy on people and be super judgmental on people, the better you can do at that, the better friends you're going to have. The longer friendships you'll have in your life, the closer friendships you'll have in your life, you'll have friends that, that trust each other, the stronger church we will be. And we need to take advantage of these things in our lives. And guess what? The more mercy God and the more forbearance God will have on us as a church and individually. So let's recognize these lessons. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.